Hello and great to have you back again. So what we learned in the previous lesson was what is charge and how its presence or sometimes absence makes various objects behave in ways that are sometimes predictable and sometimes unpredictable. So with this understanding that we gathered in the last lesson, let us go ahead and see what exactly is Coulomb's law. So Coulomb's law applies to charged particles and for extended objects that carry charge. And when I say extended objects, I mean bodies like a stick or a triangle, etc. that may be carrying a charge. So while Coulomb's law or Coulomb's equation is quite simple for finding force between charged particles, we may need to use some mathematical techniques, mathematical jugglery to establish the same force for extended bodies and we'll do that in next few lessons. So when two charged particles are brought together, they exert an electrostatic force on each other. The direction of this force depends on the nature of charge or the sign of the charge on the particles. So if the charge is same, they will repel each other and the force vectors are directed away from the other particle. But if the particles are carrying opposite charge, the force vectors will be towards each particle. So Coulomb's law helps us measure the magnitude of the force that each particle experiences and it is always equal in magnitude. So if we take two particles, let us say these are the two particles we consider and one has a charge Q1, other has a charge Q2 and they're separated by a distance r. And let us for a moment assume that both have positive charges. So we put a positive sign over here. Then if we consider say particle one, the force acting on it will be given by the formula. And let us go ahead and write it that force F is equal to K into Q1 into Q2 divided by the square of the distance between the two particles. And let us also label the force over here. Now here K is the electrostatic constant or often called the Coulomb's constant. So this is Coulomb's constant and we'll discuss more about it later. Now, since force is a vector quantity, we must write this equation in vector form. So if we assume that the two charges are, let us say on the X axis, then this force vector you can see can be written as, and let's go ahead and put an arrow on top of this so that we give it the vector notation the force vector can be written as F is equal to K into Q1 into Q2 upon R square into let us say a unit vector I. And we know that this unit vector points in this direction and its value is unity. So if we do so, we have given it a vector form. So in this case, since both charges are positive, the force is also positive because the product of Q1 and Q2 would yield a positive result and therefore in the direction of the unit vector i or in the positive direction. Well, if the two charges had opposite sign and let us say Q1 was negative, then the force on Q1 would have been in this direction or the minus i direction or it would have meant it is attractive in nature since it is pointing towards Q2. Well, if Q2 was anywhere else on the xy plane, then we would have put r instead of i. So let us say Q1 is over here, then the force on it would have been in this direction or rather radially starting from Q2 towards Q1. And we would have said that the direction of this force can be represented by multiplying the magnitude of this force and let us also put the value F which will remain unchanged because the value of Q1 and Q2 has not changed. And we also assume that the, this distance remains r, then the magnitude of force remains the same, but the direction has changed and we present this with a radial vector r, which points in this direction. So we must remember that r or i are just unit vectors that are giving direction to the magnitude of the force calculated by using Coulomb's law. By now you would have found a striking similarity with Newton's law of gravitation that is F is equal to gmm upon r square. And you can see that both laws have inverse distance square dependence and product of mass in one case and charge in the other. 
However, gravitational force is always attractive in nature, while electrostatic force can be attractive or repulsive. And this is obvious since mass is of one type, while charges are of two types, that is negative and positive. Now, coming back to Coulomb's constant K, it is often written as 1 upon 4 pi epsilon, actually epsilon naught. And its value is equal to 8.99 into 10 to the power 9 Newton meter square per Coulomb square. And here E naught or epsilon naught is called the permittivity constant and is equal to 8.85 into 10 to the power minus 12 Coulomb square per Newton meter square. And let me write this is permittivity constant. Now, a few things to keep in mind. Like all forces that we have discussed so far, electrostatic force also follows a principle of superposition. Or simply put, if a particle is experiencing several forces on it, several electrostatic forces on it, then the net force is given by the vector sum of all forces. So let us say you have a charge over here and it is subjected to, let us say, one force pointing in this direction. And let us say this is charge 1. And let us say the force on this due to another particle which is sitting over here, a charge particle sitting over here, which let us say is number 2. And the force on it is F on 1 due to 2. And if there's another particle sitting over here, which is exerting force f on 1 due to 3 and this is your particle 3 and let us say you have another particle which is sitting over here and it's number 4 and it is exerting a certain force in this direction on particle 1 and let's say its value is f on 1 due to 4 then the net force on this particle 1 is nothing but the vector sum of this force this force and this force so we can say that if there are n number of forces acting on a charged particle, let's say it's particle 1, then the net force acting on this particle, F net, is equal to the vector sum of force on 1 due to particle 2 plus force on particle 1 due to particle 3 plus force on particle 1 due to particle 4 and so on till you reach the nth particle. So there are n particles which are causing electrostatic force or impressing electrostatic force on particle 1, then the net force on particle 1 is given by this equation. And we need to put a vector sign on top to show that it is not a simple algebraic addition, but a vector addition of all vectors. So in a way, if you know all forces acting on a particle, then it becomes more of a vector problem. And we'll do a few numericals to understand this better a little later. Then there is a shell theory which is quite the same as what we learned in gravitation. So let's say you have a shell and you have a uniform charge spread on its surface. It's, it's spread uniformly. It's not concentrated at any part of the shell but uniformly distributed. Say the total charge is let us say Q and then you have another small charge sitting over here and it has a charge small q. The shell theory says that the charged particle outside a shell on which the charge is uniformly distributed will experience a force as if the entire charge on the surface of the shell is concentrated as a particle at its center having charge capital Q. Another part of shell theory is that if you have a similar sphere or a shell rather which has charge uniformly distributed on the surface and if a small charge is brought inside inside this shell and let us say it has a charge q1 then the net force acting on charge q1 would be zero so any charge put inside a shell which has uniformly distributed charge will experience no force on it and you can see it's quite like the shell theory we learned when we were understanding 
the subject of gravitation.